A spokesman said, this is the one thing we didn't want to happen. Episode 241 of 20 Minute Tims, and I'm your host Jamie, joined by Melly. Yes. And Stephen. Hello. And boy... Are we glad we postponed the podcast <laughs> for a day, aren't we? Are we not happy that we postponed this flagship podcast for a day because we gave Celtic a little chance to play the game for against Hibs. That's the reason the podcast is a day late. But Celtic managed to not only play the game against Hibs, they managed to squeeze in a massive catastrophe to go with uh, it. A, a PR disaster. Yeah, it's another PR massive on goal from the hoops over the last 24, 36 hours. It's been an exhilarating process. I'm sure we can all agree and we should really get into it. I'm just glad, Melly, that we've got a chance to actually discuss it because what usually happens with big breaking Celtic news is we record the podcast on a Monday, release it on a Monday, and then the manager, Brendan Rodgers, for example, has the temerity to quit the very next day. <laughs> First thing as well. And with this one as well, it's not one of those ones where, oh, you couldn't write it. This is exactly what you'd write. Everybody's seen this coming, just like with Celtic all this season. We've seen it coming a mile off, and the only people who didn't see it coming, again, was Celtic. We've been reacting to all this latest breaking news over on Patreon. Myself and Stephen, we took to the microphones as soon as the news dropped to release a special reaction podcast. Um, by joining our Patreon, you can keep this podcast going. You can help us improve what we do. And in return, you get hours of additional video and podcast content. We've also got a big Patreon announcement at the end of the show that we will let you into. Um, you can check all that out at patreon.com slash 20 minute Tims. And genuinely, you can support this podcast and get extra podcasts for somewhere in the region of £2.20 per month. That's happy meal money, Stephen. That's that's <laughs> happy is, meal money. It is that support uh, that keeps this train rolling. It keeps the lights on in the studio and keeps us independent and unfettered. It keeps us out of the hands of big media. You don't want that, do you? You don't want us being bought by some media conglomerate and then all of a sudden we're having to talk about certain things in a in a certain way. Not even not even big media. I mean, just to sidebar slightly, I've noticed recently a number of sort of um, sites posing as f Celtic fan media appearing and doing podcasts and blogs and that sort of thing. And then it turns out they're owned by odd media companies that have got blogs and podcasts for every conceivable football team up and down the country. By supporting us on Patreon, you can avoid that sort of chicanery over here as well. <laughs> anyway, we are, of course, all this build-up, been talking about Celtic's trip to Dubai. As Melly said, the most obvious thing in the world, Celtic returned from Dubai with a coronavirus case. Luckily, the player that got coronavirus is someone that's out for four months anyway. <laughs> Which does beg the question, Melly, why they bothered taking Christopher Julian to Dubai in the first place. And obviously, the result of that meant that 13 Celtic players, including John Kennedy and Neil Lennon, are now in isolation for 10 days. Melly, Dubai, absolute disaster. No other way to put it. Oh, absolute disaster. We spoke about it last week. Stephen said, look, just look at the optics of it. It's absolutely shocking. And it's... Stephen also said that that photo of Scott Brown and Neil Lennon is just going to be the photo of the season. That like, this was it. This was the bit where it was all meant to change. And this is where it's went even wronger. Is that even a word? <laughs> than it has been all season. It's just been one thing after another. Disaster from disaster. From the very start of this season, it's been horrible. But most of it has been Celtic's own fault. And that's the worst bit. It's like that sort of... Celtic are trying to second guess it and say, oh, look, it wasn't the us, it was, could have happened anywhere. Well, no. Nah. It's like going into your work and getting a drugs test, going positive for that and going, ah, but I was in Amsterdam when I done that, so it doesn't really count. No, like, nah, <laughs> aye, it does. You fucking idiot. Get out. Like, I'm just, I'm beyond angry with Celtic, I'm beyond everything, I'm just that. Like, I just want to see how badly they can fuck this up because I'm, I managed to just differentiate Celtic the club from the board and the, the management right now they're to two totally different things to me right now and the board and the management are just making an absolute mess of it and Melly that's you've used both of your flagship swears Stephen yes. you've, got two flag you've got two flagship swears left um, Stephen this tr Dubai trip it was one of these things that everyone said before Celtic went on it not you know it's a bad idea it's a, a during a global pandemic, squeezing the players onto a commercial flight and taking them halfway across the world for warm weather training is a bad idea. Celtic said, you know, we're doing this for performance reasons, and we did kind of 
say, well, look, that if that's your rationale, then that kind of makes sense. However, these aren't normal times. These are extraordinary times. And perhaps that should be looked at. What worries me about the Dubai trip more than anything, Stephen, isn't just the, the act of going to Dubai for warm weather training. Because in itself, there's nothing really wrong with that. And that's the approach Celtic mm. seem to be taking. Yeah. You know, warm weather training, the players benefit for it. It was performance reasons. What's worrying me is the overarching thinking behind that decision. The closed-mindedness, the not paying attention to the current state of affairs. That once again, terrible ability to read the room by the Celtic oh. hierarchy. It's it was a miserable decision. It was a miserable decision to make, such, and the such consequences an, have been miserable. Oh uh, yeah, it's such an, an enormous risk as well, an enormous enormous oh. risk at this at this point in time. And I know we'll, we'll get into all of it. We've had chat from the club since, but about how now they've basically done nothing wrong, right? But it was always <laughs> on the surface of it. It was always just a huge unnecessary risk. It, it's like it's like that old uh, that old quote from Brass Eye. This is the one thing they didn't want to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, they were yes. on a flight. They were on their own flight, their own chartered flight to Dubai. Everything safe, but it's just unfortunate. A big coronavirus got on that flight and infected <laughs> everyone. <laughs> this is the one thing they didn't want to happen. Uh, I'm I'm only laughing about this because it's my only choice. The, yeah, the it's gallows. Guy, it's the alternative gallows, is a burst into tears and start yeah. just lamenting the entire season. But I can only try and find the humour in this unbelievable situation that we find ourselves in. As we've, we've been kind of joking about over the last couple of days, over the last couple of broadcasts we have, there's that bit in Peep Show where circumstances get so bad. Mark Corrigan just says, oh, this has got to be a dream. Nothing in this, <laughs> nothing this bad can happen in reality. This has got to be a dream. It's, and I kind of feel like that with this as well. It's, it is gallows humour at this point. I text yeah. someone, I text someone when I heard, first heard the news and I says, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. <laughs> like, genuinely like given an opportunity to mess up this season Celtic will grab it with both hands oh, they will they will take it with both hands ruthless it, r ruthless aggression when it comes to, to to making mistakes what gets me though Melly is it's it just seems like hubris it seems like I will yes it's a global pandemic yes everyone's stuck at home yes we are maybe just about the only club that's going abroad for a warm weather but this is what we do we are Celtic and this is what we do another thing that just occurred to me though Melly I was reading an article in the Guardian today by Ewan Murray um, and you know that meme that goes what is it heartbreaking the worst person you know made a great point <laughs> yeah. that's how yeah. I felt when I was reading Ewan I was just reading it going he's absolutely right right so <laughs> the issue this season was the reason there's no winter break was because we couldn't fit it into the fixtures. Yeah. Neil Doncaster said at the beginning of the season, we can't really afford postponed games. One of the main issues facing Celtic at the moment is in this competition, we're so many points behind, but some of those points kind of are there to be won because we've got games to make up. Yep. Aye. So we could have played these games. We could have made up the <laughs> points. We What would do the... My, my, I suppose my question, right, to the club would be, okay... If forget everything else you guys just want to talk football let's talk football for a minute Melly what would do more good going to Dubai for a warm weather training camp or winning those two games losing to Rangers and immediately coming back and winning your two games in hand and putting the pressure on or, that to me playing the games made f much more sense or in, in an ideal world when this was sort of definitely booked and all that and Celtic were probably thinking look win all the games up to the Rangers game then we'll go a break so Celtic maybe thought, look, see if we could win that game against Rangers. That would have been us 13 points behind. Then we play a game in hand, 10 points behind with two games in hand still to go. That could have ramped up the pressure on Rangers before in the start of January. Instead, yeah. we've delayed another game, so we play after them, knowing we need to win because they've won and we get beat by them, then go away. And the best bit about it was that... Like, Celtic just mugged me off again. I get a text saying, oh, eh, oh, I've heard it's Julian that's got coronavirus. I was like, oh, that's all right then. He'll be back here. Never did I consider a club would take a player who cannot walk to a warm weather training camp. Just for what? For what? Was out long term? Is James Forrest there as well? Because he's out long term. What is going on here? Who? Why is this happening? The, the thing that gets me, see, David, is that it's, it's a, a lack of new thinking. We've done this mm. for the past five years and it's worked well. Aye, but things are different this year. <laughs> things are completely different. A lot of things can't happen yeah. this year that, that used to happen, uh, including things like that. And this this is, Melly's hit upon a good point there as well because this, this Chris Julian thing is another 
just massive red flag on this because if you want to try and tell me that all precautions were taken, we've done this in the safest possible manner, why have you taken a guy who can't take part just so he can be there? That is a, an enormous unnecessary risk, not Aye. because he's got coronavirus, right, which later turned out to be the case, but because you're taking a guy who doesn't need to be there. Yeah, that in itself is an enormous risk. And as far as the benefits way up against the, the potential risk, this is why I started talking about how enormous a risk this always was. Yes, yeah, warm weather training can be very beneficial at this time of year in Scotland because we don't we'll get terrible weather, of course, and that can be beneficial for you physically. But I feel like we've placed a fiver bet trying to win nine quid and we'll end up losing the house because <laughs> if, if that was if that was to, to benefit the players physically, what has happened as a result of it is everyone in the squad near enough has been set back at probably a month in terms of their fitness yeah. because they can't train now and we've lost two points and counting as a result of it. You, you can't possibly tell me that that risk was worth taking to take no. Julian, not only going there, but to take Julian at all costs it's absolutely absurd now to to still be defending this decision to not have at least put their hands up and said we get this massively wrong to actually just no, throw it back in the fans again to to be like oh pff, we could have got it in Scotland easily but why haven't you why why has nobody <laughs> yeah. picked it up in Scotland there's a great article there's a great article out um by the boy that writes old firm facts right I, i'm not going to read mm. it all out he goes but he goes um the, the the headline of it is from arsenal to celtic where britain's elite football clubs spent the winter break right arsenal <laughs> arsenal michael met as arteta's men trained in london because there's a pandemic chelsea <laughs> frank lampard they trained in london because there's a pandemic leicester brendan rogers men trained in leicester because there's a pandemic manchester united <laughs> Went to Marbella last year before there was a pandemic. Manchester City. <laughs> it just goes through every elite club in the whole, every elite club in, in the UK, including Rangers, Spurs. Nobody left the country apart from Celtic. Right? And, and you're right, Stephen. The whole object of this was to get the players fit, to, to, be, a, to be a net positive, and it was a net negative. And the club's response... And then some, like, yeah. the, the, the repercussions are, are absolutely enormous. It's not that we gambled and lost, it was that we gambled and lost so much more than we actually gambled. Yeah, and, and the club's response, not an ounce of contrition. Not an ounce. No, no responsibility taken, no, again. It's one thing that... I can, uh, it's it's one of these ones where, and I'm sure it's, it might be Donald Trump that said this or someone else. You know this, this theory, just never take responsibility. Never, never yeah. admit a thing. Never take responsibility. Never admit it. Because as soon as you take responsibility, as soon as you admit it, that's a sign of weakness. And if you show weakness, they'll pounce. So what? What's, <laughs> so what Celtic have done here is they've effectively doubled down. They've, uh, yeah. It's good to have role models, Jamie. If we're <laughs> looking to Trump for our for our philosophies here, then he's a successful man. <laughs> it might not. It might not be Donald Trump, but I've heard it right. from someone similar. Um, right. but, but the club's the club's response was to double down. Not an ounce of contrition. Not an ounce of even saying right. Even just saying, hey guys, look, we messed up. We, yeah, we messed up. Again. Not 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 going to the fans and going, look, we're really sorry. We 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 thought it would be a good thing. It's turned into a disaster. We're, and this sort of goes back to the the fan protest at Neil Lennon. We had this conversation and we said if the club came out at the time and we went, listen, guys, stick with us, please. We really think we can win this league. Stick with us. We're busting our arse behind the scenes. They if they showed a bit of contrition to the fans, an ounce of please guys we're on your side we're all pulling the same direction the fans would have maybe or more fans would have went right okay we're with you but they just went nah nah this is the way we do things here and it's exactly the same with this Dubai trip nah nah it's the way we yeah. do you, like, you, you fucked it you not only did you fuck it you fucked the Dubai trip and the league potentially but imagine oh. imagine we were in a, a, a tight race here where Rangers weren't miles ahead oh, and the rest of the season oh, just dream of it Melly. Oh, just I know, dream but of being in a tight race. The rest of the the rest of the mess ups, I'll no swear again, hadn't happened this season. The I can't even count how many we've had this season. Imagine they didn't happen and Celtic went away and done this anyway. It would have been a massive, massive mistake, even if we were still in the title race. But to be that far behind and take remember the other week we were rearranging games to three o'clock to five o'clock during the week yeah. so we could play at yeah. the same time as Rangers, and then we go away and just arrange another match after it. It's absolutely crazy. But I can just picture Neil Lennon in his next press conference and another role model, Craig Levine, who'll just take a leaf out of his book and go, regrets? Nah, it was a good laugh, wasn't it? 
I was amazed, Stephen, that, uh, you know, from the 20 minute times Twitter account we tweeted that someone has to go. Someone has to resign. Oh, I know. This, 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 this is as much of a resigning matter as you get. Extinction level. That, 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 well, that's, yeah, we've said that. We have said that, that about the league, and it looks like the league's headed that way. But even this mess up, uh, uh, even the fact that after when we dropped points because the squad was so depleted against Hibs, nobody has taken responsibility here. Now, no. I did notice the fan liaison officer, um, John Paul, on Twitter today saying that the fans were promised a review in November and he expects to get one by the end of January. Uh, uh, Melly's, la Melly's laughing uh, uh, well it's no good but I would expect at the very minimum at that review for Peter Lowell to say I'm stepping down has uh, to? yeah yeah I, as a it, minimum that's what has to happen Stephen isn't it he needs to he needs to uh, at the very minimum tell us that he's leaving at the end of the season Sack, falling his sword on this one Oh, 100%. But am I expecting that to actually happen? No, because I've demanded quite a lot of things this season and been <laughs> and been flatly turned down on, on every single occasion. The the communication from the club about this has been deplorable. It, it, it really has, because, again, it's just that we are fine. We didn't do anything wrong. We were allowed to do this. Again, even that language as well, we were allowed. Aye, okay, but quite a lot of bad decisions were due to something, someone being allowed to do something. Just because you're allowed to do it doesn't mean it's actually a good decision. I'm allowed to stick my fingers but, in a socket. <laughs> ah, yes, yes, you are. And the, what I said on, on the reaction podcast we recorded, I'm allowed to sleep in my back garden, but people reserve the right to say, I don't know if that's, if that's worth doing, mate. I'm allowed uh, but, to... I'm allowed to get raw chicken uh, and take it out of the <laughs> take a whole chicken out of the plastic and then that wee tray comes in. I'm allowed to tip the t chicken just into my mouth and drink it. Mm, I'm delicious. allowed I'm allowed to do that. It might result in me getting severely ill. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a bad, that's an even better analogy here. Yeah, I, it's it's infuriating, and I've been aware of people just unfollowing Celtic on Twitter and things like that because they can't stomach it just now. Because every time they log on, it's them wishing some non-entity happy birthday or something with happy birthday bio the other day and you're we're just like are you kidding are you absolutely <laughs> are you at it with this happy birthday bio the guy we'd all forgotten about who's been playing in france for the last season could happy have done birthday him could have done with him yesterday could, could have done with him and it, it just shows a complete a complete disconnect between the club and the fans yet again they've absolutely yeah. no idea for or or maybe they do have an idea but are choosing to just willfully ignore what the fans are saying and it's how the, the fans are feeling because it's the same thing, or maybe they're it? just it's the same yeah, thing maybe they're it's... just favoring that section of the fans who just will never criticize them maybe they're just choosing to zero in on that and just ignoring the thousands and thousands and thousands of dissenting voices out there who are absolutely apoplectic at how they've behaved this season Maybe that's just how they do it. Maybe we speculated some weeks ago that Neil Lennon is getting two messages. He's getting what the fans are telling him about how he's no good enough. And from above, he's getting how the board are telling him, oh, you're great, mate. You're, you're absolutely brilliant. You know what it takes to win this title race. So he's focusing on that. Mm. Maybe the board are just doing the same. They're just tuning out all of the, the messages they don't like. It's the same thinking, though. I think it's, oh, we've done this for years. Oh, people like this. Oh, people will we'll just keep, I straightforward just keep doing what we're doing without taking notice of exactly the position that we're in um, the repercussions of that were felt almost immediately because we had a game on Monday night last night against Hibs where Celtic had to line up with a severely depleted squad that saw the likes of uh, Mikey Johnson drafted back into the first team, Cameron Harper, Tom Rogic, Stephen Welsh, Connor Hazard was back as well um, and obviously get Gavin Stratton took the team yesterday uh, with the help of Neil Lennon who was communicating through AirPods by the looks of it, um, very hygienic. Swapping about an earpod that's revolting. <laughs> I've only put your earpod in my mouth. My ear melly never mind. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> my mouth. <laughs> never mind one that's been passed about the Celtic bench yet, in the midst of a global pandemic. Anyway, um, Stephen Welsh said after the game that the, the squad were struck with panic about it. One about getting the virus and the fact that it could, you know, ravage and run right through the team. And secondly, about, you know, having to be drafted in and, and playing on the game because it was obviously all a bit last minute, all a bit panicky. That showed in some of the performances, didn't it, Melly? A lot of the boys that played, especially some of the guys that came off the subs bench last night, did look like they hadn't spent a lot of time playing together. No, they hadn't. There's a lot of these boys that haven't been training with the first team. That's why they get drafted in. And the reserves, they've barely played at all this season, I think. 
they've played against Partick Thistle a few weeks ago, but they've hardly had any matches. So to get these guys flung in is very unfair. And one thing that's forgotten about in all of this, well, maybe not forgotten about, but Christopher Julian's got a deadly virus now, a deadly virus. And many of the other Celtic first team could catch that because of this. That is crazy. Crazy to put our players under that pressure when it's a sort of duty for Celtic to look after their players and we've put them in this position. It's absolutely shocking. And you have to throw in Cameron Harper for his debut and Mikey Johnson for his first start in a game that Celtic again had to win. It's just typical of the season so far. Just a quick thing on the virus. Uh, yeah, that's something else that we need to take account of, that this virus is... It can be deadly, you know, the reality is for footballers and people of that age and relatively fit people it might not be, but the consequences can run on. I think St. Mark Anne and another couple of guys at Newcastle are suffering from long COVID, so they they, they caught the disease and they're not immediately back in the team. Um, but yeah, the, the game, Stephen, it was... St. St. Maximin, dad. <laughs> is that his name? I can't remember his name. I can't do Alan the St. Maximin. Na- I don't do the names, all right? Okay, leave me alone. This is a Celtic podcast, not a Geordie one. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, you are right though. In all seriousness, um, we don't mean to dismiss the the possible ramifications or possible repercussions of contracting this virus. Like we, we, just, we hope Christopher Julian's all right with that, but that's a separate issue to what we were talking about earlier about the the risks involved, because there are, there are stories of athletes out there. There's a, a wee bit of kind of studies. There's been some articles done on some MMA fighters who've caught it and have basically been struggling to get back to training for months on end because of kind of lasting uh, symptoms of it. it it kind of d- does serious damage to your lungs and all that. I mean I'm not I'm not a doctor in like oh, you're not. any of this oh, no yeah. <laughs> just Get just to be absolute thought you thought you'd be. <laughs> I'm a doctor of podcasting ah, only yes. just a, just an honorary title <laughs> but uh, but d- just to say that but like, people don't tune in this to this for medical information of course but I, I am aware of other sports st- related stories where people are really struggling to come back from it it's not just a case of like, you get a cough for a couple of weeks and you're fine straight back into training that's not always the case you're right overwhelmingly for you know young athletes in their 20s or early 30s they're mostly fine but there are cases out there where it's, it's not quite as simple as that but on the subject of coronavirus, you know, we're, we are by no means experts in this podcast, but one thing we do know for sure is that it's caused by 5G telephone signals. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, confirmed. <laughs> Absolutely confirmed. So Celtic's uh, coronavirus squad had about six changes. And, and to be honest with you, I was quite excited once again. This is the good thing about doing a Celtic podcast during this. You get an opportunity, don't you, to when it's all going wrong, for new and interesting things to happen and new and interesting things to talk about. And this is an opportunity here to see some new and interesting players. It was like going through the Lille game all over again. As I said earlier, it's not there wasn't many of them that particularly impressed me. Some of them, to be honest, looked well off the pace, unfit. Players like Mikey Johnson, for example, he's either well off the pace, not fit yet, or he needs to do what Ryan Christie did. And I know this phrase, bulk up, is tossed about. You need to bulk up. Like, it's the easiest thing in the world whilst yeah, you're doing lots of cardiovascular exercise and being a footballer and practising crossing and practising being a footballer to also go and put on eight kilograms of muscle or whatever's required. <laughs> like, it's the easiest thing. Yeah. But there was a lot of times in the game where he was getting pushed off the ball very easily, Melly. There was. And I'm a fan of Mikey Johnson, but... It- Look, he's not played football since February when he got that injury. He's played maybe half an hour and he's flung in in a game must win for Celtic in a position that's not his natural position. And he's got a guy beside him who's never played for Celtic before and told, go out and win this game for us. It's unbelievable that Celtic got themselves into this situation. But within that performance, Mikey Johnson specifically has to be stronger. He's in the big leagues now. He's played in the Premier League before. He's played in Europe. He knows what it takes. He can't be claiming for free kicks every couple of seconds every time he gets pushed off the ball because quite simply, you're not going to get it, mate. You're not going to get it in Scotland. And all the ones he claimed for, none of them are free kicks anyway. So he's got to be stronger on that. But I will give him leeway because he's just coming back into the team and it is very unfair on him. Another player that sort of annoyed me a wee bit, you know, we do the reaction podcast, obviously, on Patreon. We react to every game and give the immediate thoughts. I know Tom Rankin was talking about this on the reaction podcast as well, Stephen, that Tom Rogic, I thought, was abysmal. Aside from a good couple of touches, but he's a senior player. He's one of the... You know, if when you're looking at that team, you go, well, thank God, Turnbull can play, Soros there, that's good. We've got Frimpong, Laxal, OK, McGregor. But Rogic's another one where you're going, right, it's not so bad. Tom Rogic's made it. But yeah, he, yeah, he, he may as well have not been there. No, I'd, and... 
Yeah, in these crises, um, the the latest of which was the Hibs game, um, you're <laughs> the looking latest. to yeah, you're looking to the. It won't be the last melee. Believe, <laughs> no, no, believe no. you me, it won't be the last. It is merely the latest. Um, the the you're looking to to players like that. You're right to call him a senior player. He's been at the club a long, long time now, about six or seven seasons now. He's was he did just turned twenty eight. You're you're one of the the main Celtic players now, or rather should be. Mm. You're really looking to guys like that to to turn up when the th- squad is as threadbare as it was. And he just didn't. I'm starting to get the feeling about Tom Rogic that it's kind of, you know, it's, it's really it. dwindled with him. It's kind of done now. I know we've we've been up and down with Tom Rogic, but I think we've been in exactly this position before where we've written him off and merely kind of urged us to, no, he's still a quality player. Look, you need to keep guys like that about. We can't just lose good players all the time. And he was good again. I think we've even had an episode this season where we thought, oh, Tom Rogic, you all must yep. have forgot. Yeah, you know, he was a good performance, but they're so few and far between. And his fitness is still a, a massive problem. I, I don't. I know it was. It became a bit of a thing with Tom Rogic where we talked about him not being able to last for ninety minutes and all that. But it's not really about that because if you can get a good intensive 60, 65 minutes out of a player, that's fine. If you can't kind of last the whole game, or it's not ideal, obviously. But if mm. if you can't kind of last the whole game, I'll put up with that. If we're getting an absolutely solid hour out of you, but you just look. He looks as if he's blowing at his ass just constantly now. Yeah. It's like Lee Griffiths or something like that. Just, he looks as if he couldn't last a half, never mind 60 minutes. It's it's unacceptable. Not just Tom Rogic as well, but see Turnbull, Frimpong. For a team that's just been on warm weather training that's meant to benefit them, none of them look fit at all. No, none of no. them look fit. No. I thought that towards the end of the game, Celtic would be really pressing with all these young players and a lot of senior players still on the pitch. We looked absolutely dead on our feet. What was the purpose of this warm weather training if it wasn't to get fit and work on weaknesses like defending set pieces? Yeah, I mean we're, we're obviously we're obviously going to get to that. There was some rays of hope as the game went on. I thought up until the set piece, Melly, you mentioned. I thought Duffy had a decent game. Yeah, I, I had a decent game. I thought Hazard had a decent game up until the set piece, but Soro as well, a decent game. But for me, David Turnbull. Now I know this seems like you know, retrospective and hindsight being the easiest thing in the world and all the rest of it. David Turnbull putting in that performance with another sublime free kick, Stephen, has genuinely now got me asking why was he sitting on the bench for four months when we were toiling? I know. Uh, normally, best... I, normally I wouldn't go down that road because you think, well, there's obviously reasons or blah, blah. But we were toiling and this guy couldn't get a game. And I don't believe for one minute... Didn't even that, get on as a sub most didn't, of the time. Didn't even get no. on as a sub. And I don't believe for one minute that, that he was plucked at the moment he was perfectly ripe. I don't imagine that Lille game just so happened to be the time he found his form. I reckon he's been putting these performances in in training. And again, it's just an indication of old thinking and bad thinking. And we weren't picking our best players when we needed them the most. Arguably Celtic's best late November transfer window deal <laughs> of all time. Since <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, what, what a sign in Dunbar was in November. No, I, I, he's looked absolutely brilliant. Yeah, fitness issues aside, he's looked absolutely tremendous. He's been on an absolute breath of fresh air, along with the aforementioned Sorrow. You know, the two of them, it's no exaggeration to say, have been the two you know, players of the season, arguably. Not easy, yeah. They're, they're, they're well, not up against much. Dunbar was player of the month. The oh, of the course, league. yeah. Um, you described uh, Sorrow as undercooked recently, and I, I do kind of agree with that. I think he's got he's got things to to learn. That he's a little bit over enthusiastic. He gets oh, involved in too much stuff. He, too many niggly fills. He's, he's maybe not so much undercooked as in need of a bit of seasoning. He needs a wee bit. Of, <laughs> right, okay. He needs right. a wee bit of cayenne pepper in there or something <laughs> like that. Just but but how that comes about is coaching. He needs yep. coached and coached and coached, and he's not going to get that under this current management. He's got a, a decent ping thing, on him, doesn't he? Sort of ah, another, decent shot, shot, another decent shot in that game. Yeah, absolutely. The Turnbull thing, I'm afraid, just boils immediately down to the Scott Brown conundrum. Scott, they, they should have rejigged this midfield, reshaped it, and David Turnbull should have been playing ages ago, but the insistence of one playing Scott Brown for far too long this season you know, comes back to, to haunt us again. It's not entirely his fault, but it's another thing that we've kind of forgotten about, that the team only changed very recently because it absolutely had to, and they played Scott Brown for far too long. There's even been chat this week about giving him a new contract. Oof. Oh, that was Chris Sutton. Chris Sutton, and then John, John Kennedy, Kennedy. basically what? confirmed that it's the ball's in Scott Brown's court. It's up to him if he wants to sign a new contract. Well, okay. That'll be all right then, because well, we'll be able to kick it back into court then. Will. Well, what I will say that is, I think a player that's been as long-serving as Scott Brown 
and you're the assistant Celtic manager and you're asked the question at a press conference, I think the correct answer to say is the respectful answer to say is something along the lines of, you know, it's we're going to leave the decision up to Scott, the ball's in his court. I think that's a respectful thing yeah, to say enough, from a member of the yeah, Celtic probably, management yeah. team. However, did, Chris, did Chris Sutton, Sutton come out? He yeah, must have found a, a bottle of Christmas gin behind the couch or something <laughs> tanked it before he wrote that column because for anyone else to suggest that is insane, in my view. It, 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 the, the rationale for it was to, quote, keep things together. What does what? that even mean? Keep why, are we still clinging on to, uh, why are we still clinging on to these notions of myth and magic about guys? Like Neil Lennon knows how to win a title race. Scott Brown knows what it takes. Like he, he keeps everything together. It, he's been out of the team for six weeks now and they actually, the, the form went up the way. And I know people like, won't, won't like hearing this, right? Because, you know, Scott Brown is the sacred cow of the squad. You can't criticise him and all that. But the, the team get better the minute he came out of the team. And the idea of giving him another playing contract when he inevitably he's going to have to play football during that is nonsense when he's going to be 37 at the end of the, the deal. So no, I, I will not accept any notion of giving him a just a nominal contract to keep him around to keep things together. If anyone was to come out and say, look, he's still of value to us as a player, right, fine, I, I'll, I'll, I'll absolutely buy into that, but not just as a presence but off the pitch you know to keep everything, everything ticking over and that, it's, it's just all nonsense and to hit out with that in a column is just borderline insulting from something and if we find ourselves in the situation next season where guys like Turnbull and Sorrow aren't playing because Scott Brown is still around because he deserves to win this he deserves another few appearances and all that I'm completely against that because we are already in the post Scott Brown era we just need to kind of we just need to get on that train and, and see where it goes. Watching Celtic the now is very difficult, but one of the only people I enjoy watching in this team is David Turnbull. You turn mm. up to games to watch him because he's he's a wee bit of class in there. Mm. And it's hard to believe that he was here the whole time. But as soon as Celtic got that free kick, I felt look, we can score this, give it to Turnbull, get MDLs else away for it and just give it to him. And the guy stepped up and pinged it in. There's not many players that can do that. That game was crying out for a wee bit of quality because there wasn't much in the game. Celtic tried and tried, but there were just there was no focal point up front and they were so blunt. There was no penetration. We wingers up front, it just wasn't working. It was always going to need that wee bit of magic from somebody to break Hibs down. And we got it with Turnbull. It was an absolutely stunning free kick, right where exactly you'd want to put it, and he put it there. And the players went wild. And when that went in, I thought, all right, this is it. Well, this game was crap, but we've pulled it out of the fire, win this, beat Livingston next week, play our game in hand, and then we go. And I brought that eight, nine minutes of belief, I brought it all back to myself, only to be crushed once again by Celtic. The free kick was absolutely sublime. It was yeah. beautifully placed. The keeper had no chance. It went through that guy. He's got such good technique, David Turnbull. That yeah, yeah. His, t his Ted Ball technique is is absolutely brilliant, and it was one of those ones when the free kick was getting taken. There was a few players around it, and you're just thinking, none of you should be anywhere near this. Well, imagine Christie was on. Oh my god, none of you, none <laughs> yeah, of you should Chris. be anywhere near this at all. I had absolutely no doubts that he was going to score that. It's one of those kind of weird feelings you get. You can sometimes tell if a player's going to miss a penalty based on you know maybe a wee bit of their body language, or you just get that weird feeling, but. This was the opposite. I just thought he's going to score this. There was no other outcome for me. David Turnbull was going to score that free kick based on the game he'd had up to that point. I think he he looks like a midfielder who's got a bit of everything. You know, yeah. he's, he's one of these guys who he's just a kind of great all round midfielder. Have I've seen enough of him to think that guy's going to be an absolute star for Celtic. And mm. I, I even said that after his first couple of games, I thought that guy that guy's going to be a cracking player for Celtic and he's going to score goals. The free kick itself, it, it was like we had the discussion during or after the Milan game where you don't give a guy like that, referring to Jalen Oglu, you don't give a guy like that a free kick in the position that Ryan Christie did because that's basically a penalty to him. And if anything, David Turnbull made it look like a penalty as well. Just swept it home nonchalantly into the top corner. Another player that I want to talk about a wee bit here was, you know, we've, we've covered the positive of David Turnbull. Let's talk about Jeremy Frimpong. He looks to me like a player that's regressed a little bit, Melly. He has massively. And look, I think that was his 49th appearance last night. So out of all the players on the pitch, I think it was McGregor, Rogic, then him that have made the most appearances for Celtic. And although he's only started his professional career when he came to Celtic, 
he's starting to, we're starting to see the what happens when you're not getting coached. Frimpong came in, he was a breath of fresh air because he was a young guy playing his own game, just getting there, no fear. We're now a full season into it and he's going backwards alarmingly and it's everything that was brilliant about him from the very start taking on players getting to the byline just that freshness that energy he brought to the team it's all gone now all gone and look that's not to say it's not going to come back he's still a very young guy but we need to help him out man he needs to be coached yeah. better he needs help looking at the way Celtic are playing right now I know we were a bit hamstrung last night but it was our own fault but even even when we've got a full strength squad, if you're going to play four four two diamond, you need two wing backs that are going to fly on and give give you the width. And we simply don't have that, and it just stagnates our whole attack because all other teams need to do is stop our strikers and our midfielders because we're getting nothing down the wings. And Frimpong was guilty of that wax out as well. I can't remember one time where he got past his man, put in a cross, or even delivered a, a cross from deep. There was absolutely nothing from him. And look, I don't want to slag from him because he is young, but he needs to do more himself. But he also needs to be coached so much better than that because he is a good player and can be so much better. His his numbers, from Pong, his numbers shocking. are way, his numbers are shocking. His numbers are way down. Um, his his crossing accuracy, you know, last season was twenty three percent for the whole season domestically. Mm-hmm. This season we're talking at eighteen point five percent now. One of the history boys abroad, one of the guys that contributes to that podcast, Gilly, has been asking me a wee while, you know, how does he compare to Anthony Ralston? He's like, he wants to, oh, he wa- here we go. He wants to know how Jeremy Frimpong compares to Anthony Ralston. So I dug out I dug out the stats from last season, and it has to be said that Anthony Ralston played a lot more football last season in the league than Jeremy Frimpong did, which I found peculiar, but it's just a fact. He was on loan at St. Johnston. He must have played more games than Frimpong did. Uh, Ralston's crossing accuracy, his crossing numbers, 87 crosses last season in the league, 30% accuracy, compare that to the 23% accuracy uh, that Frimpong got on 60 crosses. Uh, Anthony Ralston, 70% successful dribbles, um, compare that to 60% with Jeremy Frimpong and 62% offensive duels won for Anthony Ralston and 49% offensive duels won for Jeremy Frimpong. So across the board, Anthony Ralston's numbers last season were better than Jeremy Frimpong's. <laughs> that being said, I don't think Anthony Ralston is a better player than Jeremy Frimpong, Melly, but it might be that it might be at the stage now where Jeremy Frimpong, a bit like some underperforming players we've seen this season, might need to come out of the squad for his own good. Yeah, look, I, I've got a wee soft spot for Anthony Ralston. If anybody doesn't know, I was going on holiday, I was having a bit of a tough time, and my mate, he works with one of Ralston's mates, so he got Ralston to send me a wee enjoy your holiday uh, video to me. So I always hold him close to my heart. And after that, Celtic played Hibs at Celtic Park. Ralston started his first game in a while, put a wee five on him to score, 20 to 1 quids in for me. So he'll always have a wee place in my heart. That's the back. real reason. That's, it's nothing to do with uh, wishing you a good time on your holiday. That's the real reason. But if, I don't think Ralston is a better player. If he was ever going to play, it would have been last night. But I agree, Frimpong, he needs time out of the team. But again, who do we play? Because El Hamid's come in and looked terrible. We've not got many options back there. And it's just one of the, another case with Celtic that Frimpong is a good player. We've seen it. But why is he regressing? Why is nobody in this team, apart from maybe Turnbull and Sorrow, playing well it's the same Yet, question no. we've been asking all season another left back another full back rather that, that people are talking about Melly and that you've had opinions on for a wee while now is Diego Laxalt I happen to quite like Laxalt I think mostly because I think he's a good defender and he's a good tackler that's what I, I like about Laxalt however I must admit that when I thought we were getting a Uruguay international AC Milan full back I thought we were getting something entirely different and he's another one who performances have been on the decline recently uh, I'm kind of I'm torn by Laxal because I thought he was good at the start but inevitably much like everyone else in the squad has reg- regressed to the point of utter uselessness <laughs> to be perfectly honest mm-hmm. he's, he's difficult to get past Yeah, I'll give him that yeah. but, but really that is it that is absolutely all he's got going for him and really we need better than that is that is that all that much an upgrade on Greg Taylor? And bear in mind, I, I'll hold my hands up. I said that at the time. I said Laxalt was clearly an upgrade on Greg Taylor. But now in the fullness of time, I don't actually think he is. I'm trying desperately not to just do that, well, the other guy must be better thing. But I don't really think we've ever seen anything as as poor 
from Greg Taylor as we have from Laxalt. Greg Taylor has just been a kind of okay, solid enough player. The only complaint I ever had about Greg Taylor was that he was not quite what I wanted. Mm. It was just quite good rather than, you know, the, the swashbuckling, fully formed uh, I think fullback fine that I was wanted. how we described him, wasn't it? Fine. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. it. He's just fine. That, that was my biggest complaint about him. But I would kill for being able to say that this anybody in this team is just fine just now. That, that, <laughs> that would be an, a massive upgrade. Um, I, I remember during the game, just speaking of like defensive stuff, uh, I, during the game I said to, to use that, do you know what? I actually think Duffy and Hazard have been good here because yeah. they have done the fundamental basics of their positions, which is an upgrade in what we've seen recently. And Jamie, what did you say to me? I said, don't speak too soon. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. And I, and then when when it happened, I made sure to go back and quote tweet myself there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, if there's anything I do and do well, it's speaking too soon, and that's exactly <laughs> what I was I was found to be doing once again. See the the thing with Laxalt is, yes, he's a good defender, and he came in, he made his debut against Rangers, and then he had that Lille game away from home where he he made the most tackles, the most challenges in a Europa yeah. League game. That's fine. It's Lille away from home. It's a difficult game for Celtic and we needed a guy that was good at the back there. But the more games we've seen him, I always questioned it on the reactions. That we need to see more from him going forward. And when when you think back to the start of the season, that's what we complained about Greg Taylor. It was, yes, he's fine. He's a decent defender. But in Celtic's team, the way we play, we need somebody on the front foot that's going to get to the byline, going to put dangerous crosses in. We're never going to get another Kieran Tierney. But there's somewhere in between Tierney and Bowling Goalie where Celtic can get a nice wee middle ground and a decent player. But the fact that... Laxalt was brought in and I know for a fact that as Neil Lennon's man he tried to get him the year before couldn't get him and got Taylor can I just but- say something to you Millie? can I just stop you there Can I let me just pose something to you though you said you know between Laxalt and Bowling Goalie there's a decent player it, could I put it to you that perhaps between Laxalt and Kieran Tierney that there's maybe a Bowling Goalie <laughs> Is bowling goalie better? <laughs> is no, we weren't particularly fans of bowling goalie on this podcast, right? Um, but ha- having looked at our other left back options out of the three, is it pure revisionism to suggest that perhaps the best left back at the club is currently in Turkey pissing himself at our coronavirus tobacco? <laughs> Okay, I didn't. I didn't rate Bowling Goalier. I didn't think he was very good going forward. You can have the people that like Blair said he thought he was decent. He the the scout we get, but I haven't watched him in every single game. He just didn't have the heart, and he wasn't any better than maybe a wee bit better than Laxalt going forward. But nothing that I'd say bring him back because look, he's no good enough. He wasn't good enough, and if he was good enough, Neil Lennon would have played him against Cluj instead of putting Callum McGregor there in the biggest match Celtic had that season. But just with Laxalt. Neil Lennon went out and got him. He tried to get him the year before. Now Celtic, in the three formations we've played this season, and I know 4-4-2 four, 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 diamond, we've just stumbled across that, but at the start of the season it was going to be 4-2-3-1 or 3-5-2. Both of those formations need an attacking left back. I mean, especially if it's going to be 3-5-2, it needs to be an attacking left back. And Celtic's recruitment went out and got a guy who's well known for not being an attacking left back. Where is the joined up thinking in yeah. all of this? And despite everything I said about what me liking Black out and thinking he's a good tackler, he was the one that gave away the free kick. And, um, and there's one thing that we certainly didn't work on, Stephen, in the Dubai training camp, and that was <laughs> that was defending set pieces. Because yet again, we concede from a set piece. And the, the rate at which we are conceding set pieces is absolutely it's astonishing now. It's, it's just another thing that's beyond a joke. Eat, sleep, concede, set piece. Yes. <laughs> that, that's the, the slogan of the last few games. Oh, it's unbelievable. Right? It's like comical level, the amount of set pieces. It's, you can, it, I said earlier that sometimes you can just tell when someone's going to score from a free kick or someone's going to miss a penalty. You can tell that when the ball gets to a certain area of the pitch, Celtic are either going to concede a silly free kick or concede a goal from that set piece or both that that tends to be what happens so well, I mean it's our ninth it, goal conceded from a set piece in 18 games what the that, hell that, that is that is insane and now we talk about form right and we we spoke to death about what was happening at the time we'd won two games in 14 or whatever it was that this game takes us to eight wins in 20 Jesus. eight wins in 20 games now 20, a successful season for Celtic leads to us playing about 60 games. So that's a third of the season in which we've won eight games. One of them was in penalties. 
and about three of them were against some of the worst teams in the league. So th- that was like Hamilton Ackies, Ross County and Kilmarnock at the time and Dundee United who were okay. That's the kind of form we're in and those set pieces are a huge part of that. A yep. huge, huge part of it because it's almost every... Well, it's, was it one in every two games we can see from yep. some sort of set piece? Uh, just absolutely infuriating and I, it once again can only be well partly a coaching thing part, in large part down to coaching because it just doesn't seem like something we're prepared for at all this, this, this is do, definitely into coaching territory now yeah. because see if Neil Lennon was going to make this better he'd have done it months ago but we're, we're either going along in the same rate if we're conceding one every two games yeah. or it's getting worse isn't it and it's Shane Duffy again you know you can forgive Connor Hazard it's been made no, clear no you can't well hold on a sec let me let me state the case before you jump in it's been made clear that Connor Hazard isn't Celtic's number one choice Connor Hazard is in there because the, the squad is ravaged by coronavirus you can't really say the same about Shane Duffy Shane Duffy was brought in on big wages for big money and plays a lot of games for Celtic and he's making chronic errors every single time he takes to the pitch so you can sort of look at Connor Hazard and go there's no future for you really at Celtic I'd be surprised if you were ever going to be Celtic's number one but Shane Duffy I'm getting tired of saying it Stephen it's every <laughs> single time he takes to the pitch he's making a critical game changing error every time yeah. Last week we said it, bad things happen when Shane Duffy takes to the pitch. Unfortunately, that's that's just the story of his career at Celtic, unfortunately. And I'm kind of surprised he's still here, to be honest, what with the opportunity to probably send him back in January. I may be about to commit podcast Cardinal Sin number one here and asking a question that none of us may know the answer to, but even rhetorically here. Does anyone know why he was playing after John Kennedy categorically stated two days before it that he wouldn't be playing because he'd left the bubble? He got a test is that was negative, does? and I think that's all you need to get back in the bubble. Is that, is that, is that as so. simple as that? Right, I, okay, think, I think it's as simple enough. as that. Well, I assume it's as simple as that. <laughs> I hope so. I <laughs> not with Celtic, not with Celtic. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's all it was. He got retested and he was negative, and I think that's all you need to get back into the bubble. Um, I suppose we should say that Jack Ross wanted the whole Celtic team tested again before mm. the game. Uh, that, that was refused because it doesn't fall within the protocols. I can kind of understand that. I think they were tested when they arrived back in Glasgow, I think they were tested. I think between arriving in Glasgow and playing the game, Celtic would have been tested minimum two times and had a minimum two negatives by that point. So to test the squad a third time seems a bit seems a bit needless. And I can maybe understand why that request was rejected. So the, the, aside from everything else, and I think it's fair to say that the football this season and, and especially the last couple of weeks is very much taking a back seat to the off-pitch clown car that Celtic are driving at the moment <laughs> with wheels and doors right. falling off it and things happening. Um, but the fact of the matter is, Stephen, you touched on it, the form is and has always been abysmal this season. We had one job when we came back from Dubai and that was to win every game. Yep. Yeah, immediately yeah. failed at that. We've immediately the one thing failed. we knew, yeah. the one thing that was a constant throughout this is that Celtic had to get back to winning ways and win every single game for the rest of the season. And unfortunately, and I know circumstances have played into that, but it doesn't matter. The, no. the bare fact of it is Celtic have failed to do so. Been even further behind in the title race than we were when everyone was talking about the form picking up and having a review into the football side of things after a certain point in January, as we've already mentioned tonight. Five further points lost. We've now, I believe, we've lost more points in this month than Rangers have all season, and it's mm-hmm. only the twelfth or something. So that that is just however we slice this. It is not the form of a championship winning team oh, no. and, ne- and never was. No. Whatever slim hope anyone had, and this is one of the first podcasts in ages we've, we've uh, not begun with the question, is it over? <laughs> because it's redundant now. But when you look at the just the bare numbers of this season, they were never going to win this league. Never going to win this league playing the way they have because even when Celtic were winning games earlier in the season, they, they were kind of scraping by. Kind yeah. of went last minute winners against the Indian United and things. And I don't mean to completely dismiss the slight gentle uptick in form we had a few weeks ago beating the United and looking quite good at it. But the sad fact that's been rammed home once again by that Hibs performance. And I do take into account that a lot of those players aren't ready yet. So I'm not going to blame them one bit. Don't mm. put, I don't put any responsibility on the shoulders of guys like Cameron Harper and Stephen Welsh and all that. No. Not, not a bit. But the, again, the, the, the fact that it's been rammed home is that this team is not good enough to win this title and, and the record, leave the door open for a miracle, but yeah. <laughs> that is slamming and, shut. And the record will show that this league was not caused by coronavirus. This no, league no. was caused by no, no. abysmal decision-making at board and management, at board level. 
from board level down. Yeah. Another thing that occurs to me is, I wonder that all these debacles have happened this season, especially the latest one with Dubai. What must the players be thinking? What must our <laughs> high? What would the likes of Christopher Iyer and Odson Edward and Ju- what must these high end top tier players of ours? What sort of shambles am I wor- working for here? Get me out my of here. My honest answer is, I get me out of here. That's Aye. exactly what I was going to say. I where's my agent's number is and get me out of here as quickly as I possibly can. I don't mean to imply that they're like mer- mercenaries or anything like that, but there's only so much you can tolerate to gamble your career on being around this, as you described it, Jamie, a clown car of a season. So I would imagine that anyone who wishes to salvage their reputation will probably want out of here as soon as they possibly can. And it's a subject that came up briefly last week when we were talking, but we didn't really have time to go into it. But we've now probably arrived at a stage where the season is basically unsalvageable. So the board are in a position entirely of their own making where they probably have to sell these players because their values are going down. So they wouldn't be doing their job unless they sold them for the maximum value they can possibly get. But now they can't sell them because they're embarrassed and they can't. They, they need to save face, so they can't sell the best players halfway through the season, therefore you know, giving up on the title, even though it's already gone. So we're losing on every front imaginable here. We're losing money hand over fist as well as the, the reputation of the club. It's the basics of... Like Stephen saying Celtic are never going to win this league. What team have you ever seen win a league where their defence is terrible? Strikers win your games, <laughs> defences win your leagues. We are conceding a goal from a set piece one in every two games. That is unsustainable for a team like Celtic. And all the mess that's been on with Celtic this season, see if all that was happening, but on the pitch you were saying, oh look, we're still winning games, we can see where it's going if we get these games in hand one, but on the pitch is just as bad off it. The management has been shocking. Every time a team gets a corner or a free kick, you expect Celtic to concede. How How is this happening? Why do we still get a manager in place that is not even sorting this at all? There's nobody to blame here but Celtic. We've had so many chances to get ourselves back into this title race, but every single time there's a must-win game, we blow it. We simply blow it, and every time we blow it, we shoot ourselves in the foot while doing it. We blow it and shoot ourselves in the foot at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and look, that's that's the matter. That's the reality of it. And look, I, I know well, it's all Celtic's own fault. They all keep making the mistakes. But how many games can you think of where Celtic have conceded from set pieces or Celtic have let in late goals? This is basics, basics of a team that comes back from a warm weather training and looks knackered and lets in a goal from a set piece. What is happening here? These are the fundamentals of being a football team is you are fit enough to play and you can you can defend a corner and we simply don't do it there is nothing good about this team right now apart from David no. Turnbull no. an individual uh, yeah you're absolutely right Melly. My, my final thoughts on this this fiasco of a podcast <laughs> or this full jamboree we've recorded tonight is that like the, we, we started talking earlier on about you know heads must roll for this and I, I, I firmly believe that someone has to take someone has to carry the can someone has to take responsibility for this extinction level for me yeah and it might not only be one person because I actually find it quite hard to believe that Peter Lowell if we believe what we think about Peter Lobo and that you know he's missed up purse strings and all that. You know, doesn't doesn't want his biscuit tin doesn't want to spend too much money. I find it difficult to believe that Peter Lobo fought for this trip that would cost the club probably hundreds of thousands of pounds at great risk to the the rest of the season. Someone fought for this trip, and whoever it is, whether it's a group of individuals or whatever, have to take responsibility. And publicly, if uh, if it turns out that you know Lennon, in his own words described himself as the head of the football department very recently. At any point during this, he could have said, this isn't a good idea. And it's certainly no good idea yeah, to take Christopher totally. Julian along with this. So it's too easy to just point the gun at Peter Lowell. He is chiefly to blame for most of the problems here. But there, there's a, there is a chain here. There's a chain of command. And every single person, probably to a man, have signed off on this trip. And someone has to publicly take responsibility for it's this. It's astounding. It, it's astounding that nobody's yeah. came forward and taken responsibility for this. At the very least, apologise. At yeah. the very least, say, and I'm, I'm not being entitled about it. I'm not being like, oh, they'd better say sorry to me. I just mean for the for the sake of saving some sort of dignity or resp- like, but no, yeah, but respectability. But we are entitled to it. Yeah, all three of us have sat here. That old, this line that's become cliche this season, but it's fact, paid in excess of five, six hundred quid for a for a, a, a streaming service <laughs> out of good faith we've sat and put up with everything that's going on this season you take the team away on a disastrous trip to Dubai 
They all get, they may as well all have coronavirus. We come back, immediately drop points against Hibs and more or less put the final nail into our, our coffin of the season. And we don't even get so much as a, a hands up, my fault, Gov. We don't even get that. We, we, we just get told it was the right thing to do. Are you going to apologise to 20 Minute Tims? No, it's like, it's like we're, we're honestly at the stage now where the club are just like, I don't really buy into this, but it, I, it's difficult to see it any other way. The club are just like, we literally don't give a shit. We li- nah, it nah, doesn't matter. It. it doesn't matter about your opinion, and it also doesn't matter about convention. We do. We are doing what we think is right, even when it's proven wrong, time and time and time again. And even when we make the the the, the catastrophe of all catastrophes, right, and fail to protect the players when they go to Dubai, and then immediately throw the season in the bin, you still don't get a. I in retrospect, maybe we could have. No, I can so understand is- a position where the club think we did absolutely everything right. And at the end of the day, there's a virus on surfaces and you're going to catch it and sooner or later someone might catch it somewhere. Okay, that's fine. But you took, at least acknowledge that you took the risk. At yeah, least acknowledge yeah. that you took the risk and the risk didn't pay off. And, and, and on that, I just want to wrap up this little segment of the podcast. However, we did say at the beginning of the podcast that we had a big announcement and we do. Um, it is a January transfer window, not just for football clubs, but for football podcasts, and our Patreon has made a blockbuster sign, and we have brought on the terrific podcast, The Huddle Breakdown. It's a data-based, data and analysis-based Celtic podcast done by three terrific guys. Um, the podcast is already out there. You can find it on The Huddle Breakdown. It's on Spotify, it's on uh, iTunes, and everywhere you get your podcasts. But they are going to be producing a monthly special exclusively for our Patreon, focusing on the data and analysis side of Celtic every single month. It's going to be absolutely brilliant. I thoroughly enjoy listening to the podcast. The good thing about it is, Stephen, that it's it's good on the data, it's good on the analysis, but it's entertaining and digestible. And those are things that are very, very difficult to combine. Oh, yeah, exactly. And it's, you know, it is very difficult to make things like that accessible and to make it interesting for people because, you know, not, not everyone get, it finds that kind of thing all that easy to get into. It's it's a it's a growing phenomenon. The the focus on data and analysis. Unfortunately, it's not growing quickly enough for the the club we're talking about. <laughs> but you know, but uh, these these guys are these guys are very much at the forefront of data based content for for Celtic fans. So we're delighted to have a done deal. The yellow done ticker deal. is Aye. on the bottom of the screen right now. Absolutely uh, sensational, Melly Jim White here. That's my Jim <laughs> White impression. The twenty minute Tim's have signed huddle breakdown. <laughs> Not a bad. sensational, a sensational swoop. We managed to gazump a number of teams to get <laughs> yeah. this one over the line <laughs> we, in this we sent, January window. We sent David Murray's old shut. private jet. We sent David Murray's <laughs> private jet. I jetted them in and got the paperwork done. Now we also have a bit of a home housekeeping to do. Insofar as we run a competition, where if you leave us a five star review on iTunes or Podcast Addict, we send you a gold badge. Well, no, we pick our favourite five star review and send the the person who left that. A gold badge. All you need to do is hop onto uh, Apple Podcasts or Podcast Addict, leave us a five star review, and include your Twitter handle. So when we pick the winner, we can get in contact with you. And Stephen, someone has done exactly that. Yeah, it's, uh, we have a winner this week. You will like this one, guys. Usually, we, I tend to pick like really stupid ones, things that have got nothing to do with football, things that catch my eye. But you'll you'll get a wee kick out of this one. This is from Megan K six hundred, who is the winner this week. Although my great-great-granddad played for the first ever Celtic team, brackets oh. Eddie Pearson, and my family have always been diehard Celtic fans, it's taken a pandemic to get me back into it as a welcome distraction from COVID. Love you guys. Great chat and most articulate podcast about how things can change slash improve. Cheers, Megan. So we Celtic the royalty there. <laughs> I know. Someone related to one of the first ever Celtic players. Unbelievable. We the best. And she gets a gold badge for that. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you very much for leaving that review. And this is where we will wrap up. Stephen, would you like to say goodbye? Yeah, cheers, folks. It's been another cathartic one. So mm. hopefully it's uh, this is digestible. So cheers, folks. We'll see you again next week. Melly? Uh, just like Celtic, we can kiss the 10. Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's like, just, we've been talking this week about how like no. we're actually kind of like morbidly buzzing to see just how bad Celtic can get because we think it, just as it's reached the absolute rock bottom it, they somehow get worse and we've been talking about Melly's sign off <laughs> puns as well in the same way they can't possibly get worse and they do they but in a good way in a good way it's somehow so terrible they're amazing they're so terrible my only regret is that I sincerely doubt anyone has listened to the podcast this long to, <laughs> to, to get Melly's I thought my I tweeted from the 20 minute Tim's, Tim's account the other day 
Um, you can slag Peter Law all you want, but he's in there doing the work of two men, Laurel and Hardy. And I thought, <laughs> I thought that was right out the da joke book. But Melly's absolutely gun. <laughs> he's gazumped is there. Because yeah, um, Huns are selling t-shirts with that on it. Oh, 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 of course they are. They're so enterprising. And on that bombshell, we shall wrap up. Thank you for listening. <laughs>